curated by Monica Fabianska and featuring works by both Olia and Elefina. Women at War was organized by and debuted at New York's Friedman Gallery, who worked in collaboration with Boloshin Gallery in Kiev. It has since toured to venues across the United States to widespread praise, with the Washington Post and Freeze Magazine both naming it one of their top 10 exhibitions of 2022. And we are so pleased to be giving this powerful exhibition its Canadian debut. Women of, at War will be up until April 27th, so if you haven't had an opportunity to visit, please do. Um, it's definitely worth your time. Before I turn this conversation over to Monica, who will introduce Olia and Eleftina, I want to acknowledge that the School of Art Gallery is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Ojikri, Dakota, and Dene people, and it is the heartland and birthplace of the Red River Métis Nation. Treaty 1 was signed here, in present-day Winnipeg, at Lower Fort Garry in 1871, and it took territory from seven Anishinaabe and Cree First Nations to make the land available for settler use and ownership. Winnipeg's water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, and the Winnipeg Aqueduct Project expropriated 30, or 3,000 acres of ancestral lands under the Indian Act. Over 100 residents were forced to relocate, and burial grounds were excavated so that we could have fresh drinking water and electricity in the city. This is a really grim reminder of the harms of settler of colonialism and an acknowledgement that they are ongoing and omnipresent, particularly since Show Lake 40 First Nation was itself without an all weather road until 2019 and was under boil water advisories until 2021. I don't have to tell any of you that we are living through times of tremendous grief, fear, and uncertainty. As we bear witness to the unbearable cruelty and suffering that is taking place in Ukraine, in Gaza, and elsewhere, we are witnessing a disturbing rise in right-wing and reactionary political movements worldwide. And we are witnessing here the revoking of previously protected human rights. We are still feeling the consequences of the pandemic and we're contending with the existential but very real threat of climate catastrophe. It's become evidently clear that we can't continue on this timeline. And I feel like while art cannot save us, it can be a really vital reminder of our shared humanity. It can foster empathy and understanding and it can allow us to imagine that better worlds are possible. We are presenting this exhibition and its related programming in solidarity with all of those who are impacted by colonialism, war, and environmental destruction. And it is through this lens that I also wish to confirm our commitment to working together in collaboration with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation. It is also through this lens that I wish to reaffirm the gallery's commitment to presenting important and timely exhibitions and conversations like this. Programming like Women at War is a real group effort. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the support of our co-presenter, the Center for Ukrainian Canadian Studies here at the University of Manitoba. And in particular, the hard work of its director, Yulia Ivanek Squires. Squires, thank you so much. Um, you've been a fantastic partner. We are also very grateful for the sponsorship of the Shevchenko Foundation and the funding support of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, as well as academic units throughout the University of Manitoba, which include the Arthur V. Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice, the Center for Defense and Security Studies, the Department of German and Slavic Studies, and the Women's and Gender Studies Program, uh, who have provided support through the Lawrence, Margaret Lawrence uh, Endowment Fund. I also want to thank my fantastic colleagues at the School of Art and the School of Art Gallery, as well as our ASL interpreter, or, oh, excuse me, interpreters who are from ECHO. They are providing live interpretation from English to ASL. This is not a pre-recorded edited translation. And of course, I very much wish to thank our speakers, Monica Fabianska, Olia Fedorova, and Eleftina Kakedze to make time from their busy schedules to be with us um, across multiple time zones today. And of course, I also want to thank all of you for joining us with, for what will surely be a fascinating conversation. I want to let you know that um, this is being live streamed over YouTube and 
If you have any questions, there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And I would just ask that you put your questions into the chat or into the comment function. And Kaylin Harrison, who is uh, tagged as the School of Art, she will broadcast those uh, to, our, to our respondents. And now I would like to introduce you to Monica Fabianska. Monica is a New York City-based independent art historian and curator who specializes in women's and feminist art. In addition to Women at War, which is currently touring university galleries and museums throughout North America until 2025, at least, <laughs> she is also the curator of the 2021 exhibition, Betsy Damon, Passages, Rites and Rituals, um, which was at La Mama Galleria and was named one of the New York Times best shows of 2021 as well as 2020's ecofeminisms at the Thomas Urban Gallery and the Unheroic Act, Representations of Rape and Contemporary Women's Art in the US, which was at CUNY's John Jay College in 2018 and was named one of Hyperallergic's best shows of that particular year. Fabianska provided the initiative and curatorial consulting for the Museum of Modern Art Acquisition and retrospective exhibition of Alina uh, should not skip up. Oh, I apologize. In, 20, in 2012, and she was a consultant on WAC Art and the Feminist Revolution with curator Connie Butler, uh, which was at the MoCA in Los Angeles in, 20, in 2007. Her writing is widely published in numerous exhibition catalogs, edited volumes, journals, and magazines. And she currently teaches curatorial practice at New York, Col uh, New York University and is a member of the College Art Association's Committee on Women in the Arts. Monica is currently working on a book about Betsy Damon and an international museum survey exhibition for which she received a curatorial research grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation. We are very pleased to be working with you. Uh, thank you so much, Monica. And um, please join me virtually in welcoming Monica Fabianska. Thank you, dear Blur, for this amazing introduction and uh, um, expressing the sentiments that I share uh, each of your points. Uh, I would also, without naming everyone, I'd like to thank the University of Manitoba and all of the departments that came together to support this exhibition, which is uh, extremely exciting to see. I've always uh, in curating socially engaged art and that art is rarely about art. It's art, it's art about uh, various things that happen in our lives, social lives and personal lives. And it's interesting to see that we have these conversations uh, uh, coming with, with, with uh, people coming from different backgrounds. Um, this conversation is with two eminent, amazing artists living and working in Ukraine, representing two generations. Uh, we never had this conversation together. I spoke many times with Aleftina, many times with Olya. We never worked in one conversation together. So I'm very, very excited for this. Uh, and we will focus on them. I, but just to give you one word of introduction to the exhibition, tiny little bit um, of uh, the context for our conversation. And so that you don't have to look at me, but rather maybe at the images of it. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, that's the view of the exhibition, how it was presented in New York City. And just to explain, this exhibition was organized between March and June of 2022. We literally started working on it two weeks after the uh, full invasion uh, started in Ukraine. Therefore, artworks that you see were either created during the eight prior uh, years, since 2014, uh, Russian annexation of Crimea and starting the war in Donbas, or during this first two months of the war, when artists like Olya Fedorova reacted to what was going on around them. Olya spent most of this time in the shelter and we uh, miraculously were able to bring her work from Kharkiv to New York uh, under the war conditions, which means, you know, no international shipping and, and issues like that. 
Um, so now we have this exhibition frozen in time. It's, it's two years later, and that's why we will be speaking also about newer works by these artists today and how their environments change and impact the art that they make. Um, in thinking about, I, I never wanted to curate an exhibition about war. I don't think anybody could want it for themselves. Uh, I've curated once a very difficult exhibition in my life. There was an exhibition about rape, and I uh, definitely thought it was enough for one curator, but I was asked to curate this show. And in thinking how I could even approach a subject like that, I simply thought of the history of humanity, how we are taught history uh, in schools and what kind of cultural texts from Sumer Sumerian eposes, which are the earliest written histories on this globe, on this planet, uh, through the Bible, through the Confucius, how the history of humanity has been written. And it is pretty obvious to see that all of it has been written from the perspective of men, even if women can be, uh, you know, uh, figures, sometimes heroines in those stories, uh, this is not their perspective, that it is that the history is written from. And also war plays uh, the main role uh, in the history. It is a central sort of central element of history. And I was trying to uh, see uh, what kind of history writing um, we uh, would get if we would only ask women how they see events, happen, political events happening around them. And of course, I don't have time to discuss it uh, here. You, I, I sent you to read the catalog text where I explained what surprised me. I expected quite different artworks, but curators don't uh, work out of their mind. They work with artworks that are created and present in the world and try to bring them together and see uh, how we can synthesize what we see. So I was quite surprised with what I found. Some of these works in the exhibition comment on the fate of women and on the very surprising gender uh, divisions uh, of, of roles during, uh, during a war. But some of these works, uh, uh, which I think are even more interesting, don't talk about women, but about civilians and their peaceful life during the war and everything that happens to them. So that's enough uh, of, a, of a word of an introduction. If you haven't seen the exhibition, we of course invite you to, to do that. Um, after Manitoba, the show will go to Chicago and to North Dakota and San Diego. In uh, So it is my Great, great, great pleasure and, and privilege and honor to introduce the two artists uh, that became, if I may say so, friends over those two other dramatic years. Aleftina Kahida, I'm going to show her work in the exhibition on the screen so that you can be reminded or see for the first time what work of hers is presented. Was born in 1973 in Zdanivka in Donetsk Oblast, which is in Donbas. Uh, she is an artist who predominantly works with performance and drawing, based in the Mizichi village, 26 kilometers from Kiev, and having grown up in the Donetsk region, Kahidze has experienced Ukraine's abrupt and chaotic changes from the days of the USSR to the unstable environment after its dissolution, including the undeclared war be between Russia and Ukraine going on since 2014 and the full-scale scale invasion that started on, the fe on February 24th of 2022. Kahidze is now interested in plants. To her, they are still the mo a role model for us. She views plants as one of the best examples of pacifism on our planet her beliefs against the production of weapons and its fundamental impact on society are central to her practice. She is currently researching the possibilities of breaking this chain of production of weapons in general, while taking into account the existence and need for defensive and or liberation wars, as she is witnessing one in her own country. Her works, I will add, are in the collections of the Tate Museum in London, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp, Holland, Kunstmuseum Liechtenstein, Schunk Museum in Germany, Art Collection Telecom, the National Art Museum of Ukraine, etc. 
they were presented at the Malta Biennial this year. I mean, still they are still presented at, Mal uh, at the Malta Biennial. Uh, it manifested in 2022 and 2014. Uh, the Center for Contemporary Art M17 in Kiev, Elizabeth Jones Art Center in Portland, Oregon, um, Württembergischer Kunstverein in Stuttgart, Whitechapel Gallery in London, Kunsthal Trondheim in Norway, and the Stage Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, among many, many others. Since 2018, she has served as the United Nations Tolerance Envoy in Ukraine, and she also spoke at the UN Women Conference. She graduated from the National Academy of Fine Arts in Kiev in 2004, and in 2006 from Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, the Netherlands. And this is one of two works in the exhibition by Olya Fyodorova, who was born in 1994 in Kharkiv, also in Ukraine. She is a multidisciplinary artist working in the field of conceptual art, employing performance, photography, video, and text. She, um, uh, she um, in, in, involves environment as a semantic space. And apart from this, she engages in writing as a physical, uh, meditative, and self-therapeutic practice. After Russia launched a full-scale invasion on Ukraine in 2022, she started employing her language and text-based works in, into journalism and art activism uh, to raise awareness about the war among foreign audiences. Since late 2022, Olya is temporarily based in Graz, Austria. In the beginning of 2024, she joined the team of Office Ukraine Graz, a shelter of Ukrainian artists. Fyodorova, and this is the second work Olya in the exhibition, is included in the secondary archive platform for women artists from Central and Eastern Europe, Ukraine Ablaze, the Ukrainian wartime art online archive launched by Mistetsky's Arsen Mistetsky Arsenal Art Center in Kiev, and the wartime art archive of Ukrainian Museum of Contemporary Art. She had solo exhibitions in Ukraine, Poland, Austria, and Italy, and participated in numerous re art residences and group exhibitions in uh, such countries as Great Britain, Norway, Argentina, Japan, Korea, Spain, and many others. Her works are included in the collections of Ukrainian Museum of Contemporary Art in Kiev and John Bung Province Art Museum of Korea. Um, and in private collections in Ukraine, Germany, and Norway. So I can stop sharing. And uh, I'd like to start this conversation from asking both of you, Olya and Aleftina, to talk, uh, to talk a little bit about the work that we can see in the exhibition. Who wants to start? Olya, do you have a good connection right now? Uh, yes, I guess uh, you can hear me now. Maybe let's start from you, because uh, your connection potentially is less stable, so let's go with you first. Yes, thank you. Thank, first of all, thank you for inviting uh, us for the conversation today. I'm really pleased uh, to talk to you. Uh, so uh, in the show, uh, Women at War, I have uh, two works, and it's uh, actually... Uh, incredible for me that uh, one work is uh, among my first ever works I made as uh, an artist as in the, the work with which I started my art career uh, and the, um, with which I started working with the landscapes. Uh, I finished working with the landscapes uh, for now because of the uh, full-scale invasion and uh, because I lost access to the landscapes uh, of my region, of my uh, uh, home country, uh, because, yeah, some of them, most of them are uh, non-accessible uh, physically because of the landmines and the uh, occupation and uh, other war-related uh, horrible stuff, but also they are difficult to access uh, meaningfully because as I uh, say, as I feel, they are poison uh, 
uh, by war for quite a long period and it's impossible to talk about something else other than war in this landscape so uh, uh, so yeah this uh, work is from 2017 when uh, in which actually the uh, feeling of uh, the war uh, this uh, uh, danger uh, is uh, uh, still can be felt. Uh, oh, I guess you are sharing now the other work, uh, not from the not from the exhibition, but the other. But it's okay. Uh, so, um, and that work I'm talking about uh, the the war uh, with Russia was already on since 2014, but it uh, wasn't uh, that uh, big at that. Point. And uh, in Kharkiv here, though, we're super close to Donbass, uh, where the war started. Uh, we couldn't actually feel it uh, physically, most of us, to my shame, uh, my personal shame. Uh, but uh, this uh, ghost of uh, war and some uh, danger and some menace was uh, always in the air. And uh, this menace uh, is... Uh, like embodied for me uh, in the uh, image of um, uh, Czech hedgehogs, anti-tank hedgehogs made of paper, uh, which is uh, impossible, which which can protect against anything. Uh, and uh, the second uh, work uh, presented is the work I made uh, in the first uh, month of uh, the full-scale invasion uh, when I was uh, kind of trapped in the um, basement shelter in Kharkiv under the heavy uh, uh, shellings of uh, the Russian army. Uh, I haven't had any um, uh, proper materials for it, so it's uh, made on the bed linen that I found uh, at my place. It's like the bed linen my grandma uh, gave me when I moved uh, with my then boyfriend uh, to live together. So I used these uh, textiles and uh, wrote um, on them with uh, actually whatever pens I could find. Uh, and these uh, texts are curses uh, and a kind of uh, um, swearing uh, towards uh, the enemy uh, that invaded uh, and uh, trying to kill us uh, so uh, this word is me basically cursing them uh, as kind of a witch which is said that every Ukrainian woman is a witch and it has powers to you know influence verbally uh, the invaders uh, and uh, I have no idea actually how Monica discovered me uh, through social media, how she found me, but it was a great surprise actually. And it was like really, really difficult to deliver this work to to the US. Uh, I think it uh, went uh, there for three or four months. Most of the time uh, it was stuck in actually in Ukraine on the customs because of the all the humanitarian aid that were delivered here you know, the artworks weren't the priority <laughs> to go abroad. So, but... Yes, so uh, there was a little bit of uh, uh, commotion going on with the images. So for everyone's information and clarity, the first work that Olya was discussing was this work, uh, realized in 2017 in Ukrainian landscape with those paper uh, hedgehogs. And then this work, which is one of 10 prayers curses that she wrote during the siege of Kharkiv in between February and May of 2022. And all 10 are on your website, translated, and you can see how her emotions changed over this time. I think Olya has frozen, so it's a good moment for us to move to Aleftina and I will also uh, show you Aleftina's work in the exhibition while she's speaking. Yeah, hi. Um, yes, this the piece uh, by a miracle appeared with Monica in pretty 
hardly situation that I was uh, basically in Kyiv region and Russian army was around. But then it was the time of liberating this region. And I was invited to go to Venice to talk what I experienced from 22 of February until 1st of April. Actually, this is the time when key region was partly occupied by Russian army. So I accepted the invitation to go to Venice. And actually, I went there bringing the works you can see on the screen with me in my um, backpack. Yes. And I went to Venice to talk what I know now about 21 century and the whole scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine. And actually, I lost like five kilograms <laughs> since I'm very small. For me, it was pretty visible. But basically, um, the piece we are talking about is about my mom who experienced Russian army a bit early from 2014 until 2019. She was living under occupation for five years and died at the checkpoint. She was going to gather her Ukrainian pension, also to visit her sister. And she was standing in January in line for 11 hours to cross this new border between non-controlled territory by Ukraine and controlled territory by Ukraine, we say to cross line zero. And her heart didn't actually survive through this. And she actually had a heart attack and died. And what I only can show you through my um, PowerPoint presentation, the memorial actually I made for her. This could be my uh, contribution for this conversation. I was, must tell, very lucky that I got the body of my mom to my village near Kiev in 2019. Not all people would get it. So since I got her body, I was struggling for the idea what it could be to tell about what it was for me to have this relation between my mom and me for five years and she was so far from me. And basically at the right, you can see the memorial and it's a sketch of the house where I grew up and my mom lived. And basically this house kind of a sketch or symbolic symbolic, I don't know, flu plane, flu plane. And then you can see the, the stairs and then you can see the vertical marble, uh, um, let's say something like doors for me, it's doors which can show where the rooms were. So basically it's the house symbolically brought to the village where actually I do stay even till now. For me, it was so much about if the house kept her and she couldn't leave the house, she died and I decided to bring the house where her body is. So basically this is the thing. And of course you can see a bit more images, not only what was shown in your place. Of course, I have so many, some of them as Monica already wrote in my uh, biography, some institution, um, excu excusation case, or they just put them, or some of them are still in my studio. Yes, so you just can look at this. And basically all this story is about how I describe what was for her to experience the occupation time. And you can see the image at the left, she's in the cellar. And it's interesting that this image is actually describing what she has around some um, water and then the 
pickled things and also the leather, all the stuff. And it was in 2014. And eight years later, I experienced the same, but near Kiev. I also was sitting in a cellar. Also, I brought some water. Also, I had the pickled stuff like we have in Ukraine. So many people have in Ukraine. All the things we do create ourselves from our garden. So basically drawing the her life she gave me through her, the conversation by phone or sometimes she arrived so I experienced myself so basically this is the story which is actually about Ukraine yeah I don't know what I can add <laughs> you you could tell people about the retirees and their fate in in the Donbas but we can also leave it to questions it's up to you I think it could be also the space for the questions because okay. it, everything is pretty obvious. The street, one woman is killed, my mom in the cellar, dogs are running. And then uh, the drawings, which is on the bottom when my mom died and then the people are standing and, and then the flags actually are not uh, belongs to Ukraine, but it's the flag of this undeclared Danish People Republic. I don't know. Some people say that my drawings, like kids, do pretty understandable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I can, and I can. It's interesting that you make this made this connection between uh, your mother sitting in the cellar and you sitting in the cellar. The first time we talked on Zoom, you and I. In March of 2022, you were in the cellar. It was like you told me that I have to call you like before it gets uh, light. Like so it was a dawn. It was still dark. So you were sitting there with your iPhone or something in darkness. And I was sitting in the night in New York. It was probably 2 or 3 a.m. here. And it was one of the weirdest conversations I've ever had. You know, it's it, it made me feel extremely uncomfortable that there that there are no rockets where I am sitting and that I have to speak with you uh, and that there is just no 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 justice in, in our positions, mine and yours, it was very difficult. Um, but it was, of course, much more difficult for you. Anyway, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about how the art of both of you changed. And let's try to connect with Olya now. I always will try Olya first because uh, her connection might be a little worse. If you could take down your screen, Alevchina, so we could see Olya. Um, and I wanted to ask both of you, Olya first, landscape, soil, plants, environments, environment, nature. Everybody heard already that those two, uh, th those are the most important um, aspects of your art. So how did the total destruction of war, uh, you know, I've seen in numerous uh, images of burned uh, wheat fields, of burned forests. And of course, I know about uh, the fact that Ukraine is the most mined land today in the world. How did this affect your art? Olya. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm back here. Sorry, if it it can happen again. I'm I'm I apologize in advance. It's a blackout here. Um, so yeah, as I told, uh, I mostly worked uh, with the landscape uh, before the full scale invasion. I would uh, go uh, in the in the uh, natural environment and uh, you know uh, make some interventions or performances. And like to see how the perception of this uh, landscape is changed due to my actions, uh, due to what uh, I bring. And sometimes I would bring uh, some words or text messages, uh, but they um, more, were more uh, to uh, reveal uh, the uh, landscape itself, the environment itself. So the words weren't... Uh, Kind of self uh, uh, like independent in this case. 
uh, and uh, yeah, mostly I worked uh, in the several like very specific uh, uh, natural environments uh, all uh, near uh, my uh, city near Kharkiv. Uh, and uh, one of them uh, immediately in the first days uh, of the full-scale invasion became a battlefield. And the second one uh, was uh, uh, occupied. Uh, it was the field near my uh, grandparents' village house. And uh, uh, this uh, that one that was uh, occupied, uh, it uh, was liberated uh, on the 6th of May 2022. Uh, but uh, still uh, it uh, remained uh, kind of abandoned because no one could uh, actually go there. Uh, before it used to be the um, local, local agricultural company's uh, field where they would uh, plant uh, sunflowers, uh, wet uh, corn, um, all those uh, cultures that grow uh, very good uh, here in Ukrainian uh, on the Ukrainian soil and the last culture was the sunflowers so they stayed there for two years the dead sunflowers and it was kind of a tragic um, image uh, for me um, but uh, last uh, autumn they were cleaned uh, from the field uh, and there is hope that the field will be sowed again though uh, it's uh, still mined and one uh, tractor worker uh, ran uh, into a landmine. Luckily, he survived. But still, it's uh, it's unknown um, how many mines are there. And uh, you never can really clear the uh, land from the mines. Uh, but still, it gives uh, hope that, uh, you know, it will come back somehow. But I have no idea how I will come back to working with these landscapes again. Uh, I'm trying to come back to working with landscapes, but with foreign landscapes uh, in the countries uh, where I travel, where I'm displaced. Uh, but still, they're like I work with them uh, as uh, landscapes, uh, as environments that remind me about those I have lost in Ukraine and uh, those uh, to which I may uh, not be able to come back to. Uh, so uh, this is the main change in working with the landscape that I cannot work with them uh, in the same way uh, anymore. Uh, though, uh, so I focused on text, uh, writing as a practice, uh, and uh, it uh, finally became like um, a very independent thing in in my uh, uh, art uh, work uh, as uh, writing helps me to survive and stay stain and uh, you know keep going somehow as uh, Monica told it is a self therapeutical practice it remains um, this and it uh, helps me and also I share it with the other people I kind of put uh, the feelings that we everyone have in the words that people like and they want to adopt them for themselves because before they find their own words for that and uh, it's kind of I feel that I help people somehow so I keep keep working in that direction well you're now right back in Kharkiv Uh, I uh, I'm here to visit my my mom and my grandparents. Uh, I I come back uh, here like once uh, like twice a year. I I or, or more often I really try to uh, not lose connection, but it's uh, like it's a bit difficult when you are when you are here all the time. Uh, like people who are here all the time, they don't react on the war stuff uh, that uh, much already. I mean they. Uh, got got used to this uh, horribly, uh, but and I feel that I'm already not used to 
do it. So every time it gets scary and it's scarier to come back, unfortunately. What's the situation Sorry? now in Kharkiv today? Yeah. Ah. What's going on? Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, Russia is now trying to destroy uh, the infrastructure like power plants and uh, they are bombing, they're trying to bomb them uh, almost every day and uh, like very huge part of uh, the infrastructure of our region is destroyed now so we are supplied with energy from the neighboring regions uh, and uh, for that reason uh, we have a shortage of uh, the power and we have blackouts so like for example uh, before there was a schedule so we knew uh, when we need to prepare for the blackout to go somewhere to work uh, for the wi-fi uh, but uh, after recent uh, like there were really two or three like really heavy brutal attacks like one of them was this night uh, and uh, after that it just got very random and unpredictable and uh, I had uh, the power all, all for the entire day and only like five minutes before our conversation started it it was gone so um, <laughs> that's why it's a bit difficult for me now right uh can you can you be at home or do you have to go to shelter many times during the day uh I, I I hide in the bathroom as most of the people uh, they don't go to the basement shelter. Uh, like in the beginning, I had the privilege that I had a good shelter located just in my house, so I just needed to go down uh, the stairs and I'm there. But now I'm like I'm uh, live with my mom and it's like on the fifth floor in the normal block house. And the shelter is just, you know, you don't go to this shelter because it's useless. If it, uh, if the house is destroyed, you're buried un under the rubble. Um, yeah, and uh, the most uh, safe place is, like, uh, of course, it's uh, Subway. Uh, but it's quite, like, 10 minutes uh, from, from my place to the nearest Subway, which is, like, you don't go on <laughs> at 5 p.m. when they start bombing and you wake up and we just go to bathroom, though it's not the safest place in the house. Normally, you need to be uh, between two walls uh, uh, and, and you don't uh, need to have any glass around you or any tiles because it's like... Yeah. They can uh, they can do shards, which is very dangerous. Yes. Um, Aleftina, how about you and your plants? How how your work with plants is going through the war? Yeah, it's also just to answer your question that you just mentioned that what was changed that my mom was sitting in the cellar, I was drawing her, and then I appeared uh, in the cellar myself. What is the difference? And I now know the answer. What is the difference? When I did draw about my mom, I just tried to reconstruct everything what she told me. But when I started to draw myself, I put irony and humor, which is so interesting. I think because I couldn't allow produce any humor around my mom's story. But when I appeared in her shoes, I didn't want to be victim. And I started to produce all this kind of funny images about myself. So I didn't want to be kind of a person who, who really like think somebody about me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So now the plants. When I was sitting in the cellar and all the time I was reading international news and people use and not only people that the media, they use this word invasion, 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 because in Ukrainian language, we don't have this. We have another world in Ukrainian, it's uh, I would translate it literally like um, um, intervention or something like this. When I was started to hear this invasion, I said, hmm, interesting. I'm researching invasive plants. And it became insight for me so I started to think, what is the difference? What is the similarities between invasion by humans and invasivity in plant world? The biggest difference is 
Plants never wanted to invade any other plants. Basically, humans produce this chaos. And uh, now I will explain what I'm talking about. If uh, not everyone from your audience understand what I am actually uh, saying. So can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So actually at the left, there is this plant which uh, actually from North of America and the name of this plant Asclepius or milkweed. And this plant came to Europe uh, when the humans bought the birds and went to North of America and not only there, also to Australia and also South of America and just trying to discover birds. And actually they started to carry plants and this plant appeared in the time, so from Columbus time. And then when this plant appeared in Europe and then in Ukraine, so since this plant went to our place without any enemy, and enemy is actually um, caterpillars of the uh, monarch butterfly became very powerful. In Ukraine, we don't have them. And the same with Europe. So plant became very um, privileged without any enemies which can stop spreading this plant. So, and became the plant which botanist label as invasive plant. So basically this plant behave very badly to other domestic or native plants in Ukraine. And uh, not only this plant from North of America, don't think that I'm kind of <laughs> talking about this part of the planet. So at the right, you also can see another plant which called hawkweed or barshivnik in Ukrainian. This plant from Kafkas, the same with this plant. So this plant also appeared in Ukraine and started to harm local ecosystems. And this problem with invasive plants uh, are existing not only in Ukraine and also over the world. But what is the difference? The difference is now you can see also all the uh, fields and all the nature we have in Ukraine. Ola also mentioned this. You can see the holes which happened after the shellings. What is the connections? When we have this hole in our Ukrainian land, invasive plants can easily enter the area. So, and the problem with invasive plants becomes bigger, many times bigger. So I would say that we have arm invasion by humans and we have more invasivity in plant world because the world, because the war. So, Basically, this is the story about, and since I was thinking so much about stable local system, since we have the war, we can't talk about this till the war is going on. So this is my story briefly. And of course, you just see how I do draw plants that they are with uh, arms or with flags, of course. They are not like this. It's my imagination. And even if you ask me now, of course, I will repeat again. Plants are not responsible for being invasive. Only humans are responsible for this. So just to remind it again, for me, it's very important. Yes, there are drawings of yours where you show plants are the as, are the only pacifists in the world. Yes, you... what is the say the difference? Of course, now we are talking about plants where they are let's say bad guys, but they are never kill at once. Invasive plants always act through the time, so they take. Um, water from the soil quicker if it's invasive plant or they have bigger leaves they actually uh, take more sun and don't let this sun to uh, be spread to the domestic plants or native plants whatever you like to use so anyway they act through the time never like uh, humans when it could be a plant or animal or another human would be, let's say, killed in a sack. This is the difference.
in an instant. Well, you know, they it sounds like they produce blackouts for these local um <laughs> for these local plants, like talking about what Olia just uh just shared with us about her situation today. Um let's talk about language. Uh it's it's amazing that this two sort of planes, one being nature and the other being language, is is present in the works of, of both of you. And uh Olya, are you with us? Yes. So I will ask uh, you first. Yes. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. in Aleftina's drawings, language is always there, but language was not a subject by itself until the recent film that she made, where, where she starts digging in the history of her family. But for you, language has always been the one of main things, even when you worked in, la in landscape, there are so many works where you produce, for example, those huge... Uh, signs in the fields uh, with text or you use uh, like plaques that announce what city you enter and you also change them. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of like road signs that you produced in open landscape. And now your work changed. You as Aleph Tina, both of you suddenly were, were inspired to look into your family's histories and into your relationship with language. And uh, this is the major change that I see in your work. I remember our conversations two years ago, and these conversations were very different. Uh, you were so much more idealistic. And what is important for all of our audience to know, you were both raised with two languages that you have different relationships with. So Olya, start, start. Um, and remember that you can share your images or you can ask uh, the university to share your images. Yes, uh, can you please uh, share them? Uh, because yeah, I don't have access uh, yet to that presentation. Uh, so uh, yeah, actually um, I used to practice uh, yeah, writing. Uh, uh, before uh, the full scale invasion, uh, but uh, after, like, since this uh, work uh, that uh, is part of it, which is present in the, at the exhibition and the, the one that I'm showing here, uh, this is here uh, where I felt uh, the importance of uh, speaking up, uh, the um, expre expressing the emotions. The strong emotions and uh, putting them in the into words, uh, which I've discovered. Then it's uh, yeah, it's that was my uh, therapist suggested me to do later, and uh, this is like a common practice. You name the emotions, you um, put the, try to verbalize them, and then this is how you can pro process them. Uh, so uh, the main emotion I had uh, with the invasion was, uh, of course, uh, anger, a lot of anger. And uh, the um, fact that I um, could express it, that I dared to express it, uh, was uh, very, um, you know, liberating for me as a woman, too. Because uh, in, in uh, Ukrainian culture, still... Uh, and then, like you know, and it is like a global contemporary culture towards uh, women. Uh, that kind of uh, limiting the uh, right and the possibility for women to express these strong emotions, to express the anger and you know the aggressiveness. It's still kind of uh, not. I would say prohibited for women, but uh, it's not desired you're like if you're uh, expressing that you're kind of uh, uh, not uh, so valuable in this hierarchy and this in this market i would say in this uh, in this like system uh and um i, I personally and most of like women in my family used to suppress uh, those strong emotions and uh, you know not to raise voice not to swear but when the war started like when the we heard bombs and uh, uh, fighter jets flying over our heads and heard about all these uh, horrible crimes that uh, um, Russians committed uh, it, it, it became impossible to uh, continue suppressing it 
and uh, I put them into words and I felt this strong urge to put them into words. I used whatever I had to put them into words. And uh, uh, this uh, like was a life-saving thing for me. I could, you know, um, save myself, save myself from insanity at that point, and uh, put my adrenaline and uh, and girl uh, there. Uh, also, as I as I uh, said, it helped other people. As you can see this here, many people like my friends and also random people from the internet. They they uh, wrote me asking to borrow these words as is it in form of tattoos or in form of like prints on the clothes uh i could get some uh, you know uh useful things i raised some uh, donations uh, some money on that to help uh, my local battalion and the pet shelter i'm friends with uh, so uh, but it was like really uh, important to see that uh, people uh, feel these words too. They feel uh, the you know emotions behind those words, and uh, they can share them. And uh, actually, like this approach uh, helped me to cope with any you know um, uh, like stressful and uh, horrible situations like. For example, uh, this uh, work that you see is from the next series that I already made in the, when I evacuated to in, uh, to Graz to Austria, and it was the my reaction on uh, first uh, there was like this first attacks uh, uh, on uh, civilian infrastructure of Ukraine in uh, autumn 2022 uh, when they first tried to deprive us of the electricity and power and I uh, and at the same time in Europe I heard a lot of this like you know you Ukrainians are too aggressive you're too emotional uh, why can't you be like more calm and like that was that was felt and uh, these uh, uh, works new works that I made uh, it was the reaction on both of uh, those uh, um, situations, and I included not. Uh, I added to the text also the physical uh, action. I started, you know, uh, physically interacting with this paper. You see, it's like kind of damaged and uh, almost uh, destroyed, and it's also like uh, was. Uh, Thera therapeutical thing in terms of um, uh, getting rid of uh, this body anxiety, body you know suppressions. I would say, uh, yeah, you can you can continue to the other page. <laughs> yeah, so I allowed myself uh, a bit um, like stronger uh, words. And uh, it also uh, was kind of uh, felt uh, like people felt it, people uh, solidarized with me. And uh, also um, what uh, was also important for me that it's not only related to war, it's related to my uh, woman experience. I spoke as a woman too, uh, as like, uh, because, the I, I would say the uh, my evacuation to Austria was connected to also not only to the war but also coming uh, go out from the uh, long term uh, difficult uh, relationship uh, and uh, I spoke also as a as a woman here and uh, so this uh, in this image this. Um, works uh, were uh, in Kharkiv uh, in the first uh, exhibition that opened uh, in this uh, uh, art center after the invasion and it also when when they opened this exhibition uh, you can see the translation on the right so it's quite like uh, you know uh, quite the language uh, there and the, uh, the opening ceremony there was also a blackout so it was a perfect kind of environment the Russians created for these works to be presented. Because that 
what was written on the works, uh, all the people here, all the people there felt uh, by themselves. Uh, and uh, then I continued to, you know, work working with the lang uh, with the language, with the written words as uh, kind of a tool for uh, tool for healing. But also, but my anger uh, faded, uh, started to fade as I evacuated uh, from Ukraine. And in the peaceful environment, you can no longer exist only on adrenaline, only with powering yourself with anger. You need to, I felt that I need to, um, you know, not calm myself down, but uh, uh, feel something else. Uh, con con come back to uh, the life, uh, which is where somewhere, something else except for anger uh, is present. And then I started to you know, write uh, some kind of prayers, um, kind of, uh, um, you know, not curses, but spells that would help me in this healing journey. And uh, I started using the transparent materials and somehow also um, like embedding, incorporating uh, the text in the environment. Uh, it's like environment of the place which is which is not my home but became but was forced to become my temporary home uh and uh, i tried to at least inhabit this space with the, the words of my self support so like uh and the transparent material transparent fabric helped like to to put this text in the environment so the environment is present uh, and is uh, can be seen through this recording when you were inspired by the notes you found of your grandmother uh yes actually uh this uh, prayer is that i wrote is partially based uh, on uh, the prayer that uh, I found like as a document in my uh, great uh, grandfather's uh, house. So when they died, uh, my great grandpa and uh, great grandma, uh, we like had a pile of their documents, and there was one folder uh, where I like with the old old uh, newspapers actually. And actually, it was funny because all those newspapers were dedicated to the deaths, uh, to the funerals of uh, you know rulers of communist party. To the, the funeral of Brezhnev, funeral of the other guy who was, was like they died uh, every year that uh, the period and I, I don't know why but my great grandpa collected all these uh, um, you know articles about them uh, being <laughs> buried. Maybe he uh, he he had some pleasure in reading uh, about you know communist party leaders dying. Uh, but uh, among these uh, documents, there was a very like small uh, paper uh, on which uh, this uh, prayer, the like, was written, and it was my grand great grandma uh, handwriting. Uh, so my grandmother recognized it, and it was like a protective prayer which uh, great grandma wrote for her husband and like to protect him and their household. And it was like a very weird mix of, uh, you know, like really Christian prayers and some curses. And uh, it was like really something uh, very strong and not very, very unconventional because, uh, you know, the, my uh, great uh, grandparents, they, uh, though they lived in the village where the traditions were still kind of kept, but uh, the they were born already in the Soviet Union, which was the, you know the, the, where religion was banned. But they still uh, kept these roots through them living in the village uh, and through some you know folklore or everything. But but it transformed uh, through their non-religious life uh, in and and. Uh, and received some very interesting uh, forms. So I adopted it and I a bit uh, changed it uh, for myself. And it's like my uh, 
very personal prayer through which I still uh, feel this connection with my uh, my great grandparents. So let's ask Aleftina now about her family and and her language. Um, yeah, it's like Olya mentioned that uh, Ukrainians suffering so much from 2014 until now, but we do suffer so much stronger when we are asked to be in a way we are. I also was asked many times, what is the problem with Russian language? Why you are so kind of uh, radical about this? Because I understand the value of the countries where the peace is a value that all languages has to have the rights to exist or be not discriminated or something like this. But when you're in the war, many of the things could be actually seen from different uncles. And I try to actually explain what I'm talking about, what is my relation to Russian language. So basically, at the left, you can see me drinking wine with my uncle. And this is actually the first time I appeared in my father's house. Until my grandma from father's side, his mom was alive, I didn't have a right to step in it. And it's not so much about misogynia, not. I'm talking as a woman now. It was the thing that my grandmother, my dad's mom thought that we are Russians. And since the whole story between Russia and Georgia, maybe I have to tell. Right? You have to say that. <laughs> yes, this is what the point. I'm sorry. So Kahidze, so my dad was Georgian and my grandmother from his side was Georgian woman. So she didn't want to meet me and my brother because she saw that we were Russians because we spoke Russian language. When she died, my grandfather, again, I don't know, Monica, what you would say now, also Georgian, he said to my father, bring the kids. Actually, we had opportunity to enter my grandma's house and I am drinking wine with my uncle. And then at that time, it was not digital photography at all. It was 90s. So somebody took a picture of me and I brought home the film and then developed the film. And then when I saw the photo out of it, I noticed my grandma in a portrait. She's watching me. Pretty scary. So, but why we spoke Russian? We were Russians? Not. At the right side, there is another grandma from my mom's side. Uh, she's in the center. She spoke Ukrainian. She was Ukrainian. And a bit, if you can see my neuro, my grandma, so this is grand grandma, and this is my grandma. She also spoke Ukrainian. And this is the family photo where two kids are missing, also girls. They were twins. They both died during the artificial feminine, we call it Holodomor. The feminine, yeah, feminine in 1932-33, yeah. So, actually, now 28 countries recognize Holodomor as a genocide of Ukrainian nation. So, at that time, they lost two kids, two girls. They had to do something. They run to Donbass, where the story began for me to talk about. And you, Monica, actually showed the work is about. So they went to Donbass, my grand-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mom was born there. It's interesting that only when the whole scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine took place, I started to think in the cellar. 
why it's, the situation was like this, that my grandmother spoke Ukrainian, even I do remember, but my mom never spoke Ukrainian, only Russian. And grandmother from father's side, Georgian woman, he heard her Russian. So, and then the photo is actually on the bottom. This is the Donbass in the time. And you can notice all these Vishivankas. So, I remember that my grandma spoke Ukrainian. But then what happened that my mom stops to speak Ukrainian? Of course, this is about politics of Russian Empire at that time. We call it Russification. And the biggest problem with Russification that even me didn't think about what happened in the family that two generations of women did speak different languages. So this the story is about. And next slide is actually at the right, me, my ear, when I hear Russian somewhere on Estonia or in Germany or in New York even, but not in Ukraine. When I hear Russian in Ukraine, I know that the people I grew up, if it's neighbors or my husband, or again, the sister of my mom, who still does speak Russian. Of course, my ear not like in this drawing became red. But when I'm in the situation, context, country, crowd, anywhere, hear Russian language, I'm in strange mood. I feel insecure. I feel really like the situation is sometimes not even under my control. And it's very interesting that my mother tone is Russian. And I have this strange feeling. And if we have time, uh, I will show you fragment of the movie or video performance we filmed in Odessa with director Roman Himei, where I'm speaking Ukrainian, almost screaming. And the word is like this. The things I'm speaking in Ukrainian. And I'm talking to my dead father. So my mom died, my father also died, and they were alive and all these wars with Russia started. They died, but the wars are still going on, you know. And actually, you can read some subtitles, but you also uh, can hear the temperature of my screaming or wipe. How I do this? So let's experience. Can we play, Monica? Let's have a moment to see a little bit of the film before we jump into Q&A. I believe we do. Sure, of course. Let's, yes. let's see. Yeah. Don't lose the time, okay. І тоді я опинилася в будинку діда, і дядя каже, ну давай трошки вип'ємо. І ми п'ємо з кубків, а я відчуваю, хтось дивиться. А це бабушка. Бабушка. З портрета. So the audience probably couldn't uh, notice the very exotic alphabet. That's how Georgian is written, and you were speaking Georgian there. It's pretty um, amazing to remember a sentence like that from your own grandmother. I think this is very complicated, what you're speaking about. I, I'm not sure how. I hope that the audience will have more questions about this. Uh, I think that from the Northern American perspective, uh, 
um, you know, Eastern Europe is a complete unknown and it's seen like one monolith. But what you're speaking here about is a very, very, very complex uh, ethnic structure of, a, of an empire and, and um, very fraught relationships between all of the peoples who have been living in uh, and around sometimes independent and uh, usually um, under the empire shoe. Um, do you want to add anything or can we jump uh, to, to, to the questions and see if the audience wants to ask? I guess I'll just ask if the if, if anybody does have any questions that they like type them in the chat and um Caitlin will relay them, relay them over here. And um I guess I have a question to start if that's okay. Um I think it's just really remarkable and thank you so much for, for both uh, being so generous with your, with your insights and your, your personal stories. Uh, I was really moved by them. Um, and I am just interested in how, how you keep making art through these, these really difficult situations. Um, I feel like, I feel like sometimes even at the best of times, like maintaining an art practice can be quite challenging um, because there are other demands that 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 sometimes take precedence. And I'm just wondering how, how you maintain practices. It's a very broad question. Thank you. Olya. Yeah, I can, uh, as I noticed, like, um, We were very like all artists I know. They were, we were in a very different situations. Some stopped uh, making art. Some uh, became uh, even more productive than before. And uh, it was just a matter of uh, you know your mental capability or your response. Uh, as uh, the similar as uh, it's uh, it's told that uh, there are three types of reaction and stress. Uh, run, freeze, fight. And I think it's also with art, um, it was the same. Like for me, uh, it was really necessary to uh, make art, to write. I like for the first month of the invasion, I didn't make art. I just wrote a lot of uh, uh, articles and uh, posts in social media and I talked a lot which was also, you know, kind of as writing and the uh, word is uh, the part of my artistic practice. It was also part of my artistic practice. And uh, yeah, as I told it was the, for me, it was the, the only way I could uh, stay um, like literally alive, um, mentally sane. Um, now, actually, I also feel very privileged that I am um, I have this uh, resource to make, continue making art and I have this opportunity to make art because um, some of uh, my colleagues and friends, they cannot uh, make art anymore and they stopped making art, not because they lost their mental capacity, like, but because uh, some of them went to the front line, for example, and they, they cannot make art there. Uh, some of them just, you know, some of them died, unfortunately, uh, because of the Russians. And uh, I, I feel that I can't uh, just stop um, making art uh, because it would be like, you know, unfair. Um, like I, I can, at least I can do that. Some of my colleagues, they would love to make art probably, but they can't, they were deprived of this, uh, of this. And I have the privilege uh, of, uh, even, even like when I'm in shelter, in basement shelter in Kharkiv, uh, but I'm alive. Uh, 
and uh, like uh, yesterday I was working uh, during the blackout in the full darkness and I had this uh, light on my head while I was working and uh, it was still cool I felt like oh cool at least I can make it. I can make it and uh, I I felt that this uh, you know it's just uh, the sign for me that the life is still uh, going on that this uh, the this activity where I felt the most um, happy and the most um, effective and productive and the most you know alive uh, while I'm able to continue it that uh, it, it, it's, it's really it's, it's great um and i uh, i was uh, sure that uh, in every situation i will try to you know uh make it uh, so i continue doing art and while i'm while i while i'm able to continue that it means that it's not that bad yet when i when i stop completely then it like there there are problems <laughs> so yeah that's really incredible. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Alectina, do you have any thoughts about that? I agree with Zolia. It's privilege. All in Ukraine who produce art, we do feel kind of being ashamed. But then when I have this feeling, I also start to think that doing art is part of the economy. Sometimes I do sell my works or I receive fees from which I can donate. Mm -hmm. Also, so many people around and even my neighbors in my village, they encourage me to do my art because it tells what we are experiencing and what is actually the story is about what the war in 21 century or something like this yeah when they say this but still i said yeah thank you you're pretty kind to tell me this but anyway it doesn't help so much we all feel ashamed you mean guilty yes like a kind of survivor's guilt or like like a yeah i did i didn't want to use yeah. this word guilt because it's not guilt Mm. It's like, I don't feel killed. Mm. I feel ashamed. Mm. It's kind of something in between being privileged and being kind of when your face is red, it's not guilt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and well, maybe I have to improve a bit vocabulary around this. No, I think they're very subtle distinctions, but they're they're kind of necessary distinctions, right? Um, well, I do think that it's uh, it's been really, really powerful and really meaningful to see images of, of life carrying on and and images that kind of articulate an emotional state and like kind of a that, that there's something personal and like from the hand. Um, so I think it's it's really valuable, even as we're kind of seeing a lot of like media images from the war to 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 have personal accounts is is really impactful and empathy building. I have some questions from the chat. Um, first from Barb Hunt, um, who asks, Elftina, how does humor help you feel that you are not a victim? Like, can you talk about the, the use of humor in your work? But if you allow yourself a humor, you always have the distance. Mm -hmm. You can't produce any humor or ironical statements if you're inside of the situation suffering or you have pain and you can't control a bit irony humor it's a sign that you reflect on yourself and there is a distance when you have a distance you are a subjective amazing thank you and um, Michael Zajak asks if you could um, remind us where you're located right now and, and kind of how you're, maybe how you have um, gotten to the places that you are. 
I, I, I haven't. I, I guess just I guess um, Michael just wants to be reminded, like wh where you're located right now. And uh, actually, I, I, I was in Ukraine and I just uh, came to New York to give a lecture, and then from New York I went to the Netherlands to work on my um, solo show and also group show by Ukrainian artist in little place in the Netherlands called Hirlin. Congratulations. And by the way, the group show I just mentioned, it's actually set by 14 Ukrainian artists. Monica, I'm a creator now. And three of them do actually serve in Ukrainian army. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, it's like work from the front lines. And Olya, you... You are you are visiting your family, yeah. Yes, I'm currently in Kharkiv, uh, where like uh, my mom's here and my grandparents are here. Uh, but like they, I'm based now in uh, in Graz, in Austria, and uh, like there, I'm like as a part of our uh, organization, uh, Office Ukraine. Uh, I'm uh, helping like the they helped me when I evacuated uh, in summer 2022. And now I'm helping uh, also the other colleagues uh, uh, from Ukraine, uh, not just to, you know, to evacuate to a safer, a safer place, but also to integrate and to like, we are building a community, a sustainable community, uh, because uh, yeah, uh, after some months uh, in the war, we understood that you know it's it's not going to end very soon and uh, we need to carry on somehow even if we are displaced um yeah we need to continue not just being like continue working and not just stay refugees for the rest of our lives not not be like try to turn the temporary situation into something uh, I wouldn't say permanent because everyone is dreaming to come back to Ukraine, but you know, to something more stable and uh, sustainable. Right. Thank you. And uh, we also have a question from John Goods, um, who asks, "What does the recognition of Canadian, U.S., and and European institutions mean to you?" I I, I believe. That you're that he's um sort of addressing the uh the that that your work has um sort of traveled that this this body of work is traveling in particular but but you're also you all have um very kind of international art practices i think uh, I, I would say like from yeah uh, from my point of view uh i mean uh uh, the uh, having the work uh, traveling in a, throughout through North, North America for me it's like um, you know it's uh, this similarly valuable as having it uh, in Europe somewhere but um, it has uh, like uh, like I'm I'm always happy when I when I uh, am given an opportunity to show my work and to talk about Ukraine through my work uh, abroad because it brings uh, more allies to us um, somehow more people get uh, engaged uh, um, and supportive um, but uh, yeah uh, in Europe uh, we're closer to you know to the European Union and to you know Euro European associated uh, countries it's easy it has been easier to bring your work there um like most of the time uh, because just because of the you know distances <laughs> but so uh, that's why uh, having the work in, in uh, the US uh, in Canada or like uh, in Japan for example like for me or in Australia like far mm -hmm. uh, where you normally don't have like it's rare for me it's rare to have the work uh, so far from Europe and that's why it's uh, an additional value for for that. So my word reached the further uh, 
places, the people in that are like um, um, that far that are far from me, like thousands and thousands of kilometers. So it's it's kind of cool. I'm sorry, Ola, and Olia, I interrupted. I wanted to add something. You know, when we organized this exhibition in New York, none of you lives in the United States or in Canada, but I have lived here for 25 years. And um, I knew very well what was going in the moment the war uh, exploded for the West. The war that was happening for you already for eight years, but nobody gave a dime. A regular New Yorker wouldn't tell wouldn't tell a difference between Russian and Ukrainian. People didn't mostly didn't know that Ukrainian language existed, except for Ukrainians and people from Eastern Europe. And there is this kind of Western gaze, you know, the kind of pornography spectatorship of of the wars. There was never interest in Ukrainian art. There was never interest in Romanian or in Polish art. There was always interest in Russian art as a another empire at the other end of the world. Uh, so before this exhibition opened in New York, there has never been a group show in New York City of Ukrainian artists who live and work in Ukraine, not in diaspora, and are the best artists of the country and are selected, you know, from the group of the best artists who have a little bit of international recognition in, in the West. And actually, when I was doing my research and I looked at the history of 20 years of presentations of Ukrainian art in European institu Western institutions. I was also surprised that I didn't see too many of them. You know, a few in London, some in Austria and Germany, uh, mostly in Poland, but, you know, Western of Germany, literally almost nothing. So the whole point of the exhibition, I we knew that uh, if Ukrainian culture is not known. Ukrainian point of view is not known. How how the hell is anybody going to understand what this war is about and why Ukrainians want to have their own independent country and defend it because they had it, right? So that's that's why it's so important. And, and also uh, the reason why this exhibition is traveling to the universities is that I know the history, at least in the United States, uh, almost all the Slavic um, Departments at the universities have always taught Russian and very little, um, very few of them taught either Czech culture or Ukrainian culture or Polish culture or the complexity of the colonial uh, aspects of, of the history of Russia. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and, and I think for, for kind of providing some of that context and I think some of the challenges of um, sort of creating an exhibition that is uh, legible and kind of helps uh, bring people bring people to these stories. I think it's it's very it's very generous and very generative. Um, I guess we are at time, but I wanted to say, like Elftina, would you would you like to? Yeah, I'd like to on? thank you. I like to thank Monica because this is just unbelievable what she did. If to talk about uh, my own recognition in Western institutions or Americans, so before the whole scale invasion of Russia, uh, actually amazing uh, curators from Portland found me and asked me to draw this story about Lumnik Andreevna, which is actually in the exhibition. And I did this, sent the pretty big uh, drawing to uh, Portland through the mail. Uh, yes, but if to talk about Canada, first time. First time. I'm, yes, first time. Monica, thank you so much. You brought not only me, but other amazing Ukrainian uh, female artists to be uh, introduced. And I agree, we have amazing dynamic of developing Ukrainian art scene. I do teach, ah, actually I did teach before the whole scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine. And we had so many, many young artists growing and in institutions as well were developed in pretty good speed. So of course, now the time that Ukrainian 
art is has to be on the platform having a voice otherwise of course it's not clear what is the voice about thank you thank you so much and uh thank you everyone for your insights um for your for sharing your work and your ideas with us thank you monica for um making this beautiful and potent exhibition and uh and making it possible for us to exhibit it it's it's been really remarkable and uh thank you so much Elftina and Olia for for joining us thank you thank so you. very much all right thank you um and then this conversation